Hi, my name is John and welcome to Invest Us. I started working in financial services back in 2000 and it was a fantastic time to be in the industry. There's lots of um, larger than life characters about and I'd started working for an asset manager in South Oxfordshire. At the end of my first week I was called into the, the, the CEO's office and he looked at me, sort of sized me up and down and said, do you want to be rich and happy? So I'm 20 years at the time, I've worked for seven days and I thought, Sounds pretty good, so not enthusiastically. He said, do you want a long career in financial services? Again, end of first week at work, not much older than you guys, didn't really know what to say. But before I could answer, he said to me, good, you need to do three things. Never leave your golf clubs in the back of your car, never wear brown shoes, and when you're talking to a group of people, be bright, be brief, and be gone. So, this session lasts about 20 minutes, and I'll be gone. So by definition, I'll have been brief. Hopefully, I've got always a bright session for you guys today. So what is it investing? So as the only brown shoes on show today are mine, I'm pretty safe to carry on. Investing is a very, very human concept. It goes back millennia. Once we've taken care of our very basic human requirements, what do we like to do? We like to put today's surplus aside for the future, and we like to protect those that are most important to us, those that we love. And what was the way we did that a couple of centuries back? Well, we'd create greenhouses to take today's crops and put them aside for a point in the future, and we'd build fortresses, walls, houses, castles to protect those that are most important to us. Now, those are very, very tangible solutions. We can look at those and go, we've got a greenhouse and a big wall, our future is protected. But today, the answer is very different. Today, the answer is assets and financial products, which by their nature are very, very intangible. And as an industry, we've not made it easy for consumers of financial products. We've wrapped a lot of complexity around them. So while the need is very, very simple and very human, what we've created are complex assets and complex products. But this isn't something new. Let's have a quick history lesson. When I say history lesson, I actually mean a question I was asked recently in Trivial Pursuit. And it was for a yellow watch, so it was a history-based question. And the question went like this. What do Vasco de Gama, Jacques Cartier, James Lind, and James Lancaster, and Charles Glenn King have in common? So it's one of the tougher Trivial Pursuit questions I've been asked. Well, if you go back to the 14th century, Vasco da Gama was an explorer and conquistador, and he was busy exploring and conquering things. And his, his team, his crew, came down with a mystery illness. And he found he gave his team, his crew, more fresh produce, this mystery illness was cured. We'll look forward to the 15th century. Jacques Cartier is working his way around native Canada. And again, his team of explorers are struck by a mystery illness. The native Canadians boil up some pine needle tea, and the illness is cured. Well, we forward to the 17th century. James Lind and James Lancaster are writing theses on how to cure this disease, and they're widely dismissed as the solution being presented just being too simple. And it's not until 1935 when Charles Glenn King discovers vitamin C that we find the cure for scurvy. So why then did it take 500 years to find a cure for scurvy? Now this was a disease that was putting armies on their knees and questioning whether armadas had the potency to fight. Put yourselves in the shoes of the Admiral of the Spanish Armada. They've sailed all the way to England and his men are getting sick. They're on their knees. They can't fight the English. And he's being told, you know what, all you need to do is give these guys a, a nice cup of lemon tea and they feel better. The problem seems like a big one, an immeasurable one, but the solution being presented is incredibly simple, almost too simple. So as human beings, we like to create complexity where a simple answer is really required. We have this in, a, in, in investing as much as we did back in the 16th century with the Spanish Armada. So this is the area I'd like to look first at you guys. It's an area highlighted this year. Uh, a gentleman called Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize for Economics. And he looks at the way we make decisions. 
the kinds of decisions we make well and the kinds of decisions we don't make so well. He wrote a book called Nudge based on his uh, Nobel Prize winning thesis. And I'd like to demonstrate his thesis using two pieces of paper. So the first piece of paper, if I screwed it up and I threw it to someone, chances are they'd catch it. And they'd catch it intuitively, almost without thinking. Now those are the kind of decisions we make well, the decisions we don't overthink. We just let them happen naturally and simply. Now if I take a second piece of paper, a normal piece of A4 paper, and I fold it one time, I fold it two times, and I fold it three times. Now it reaches a thickness. Now if I folded that piece of paper 60 more times, how thick would my piece of paper be? Now the first time I saw this, I thought maybe about my height, about six foot. But it's not six foot. It's not feet, it's not meters, it's not kilometers. It's from here to the moon. But it's an incredibly difficult concept for us to grasp. Why? Because it's an abstract concept from this piece of paper. It's also an extrapolation from a point in time today to a point in the future. Abstract future concepts are the ones we struggle with. And so often investment decisions are about making decisions today and seeing the benefits at a point in the future. So the first concept that we wanted to really highlight with you guys is something called the behaviour gap. So over the last 20 years, the S&P 500, the value of the 500 largest stocks in the US, has returned about 8% a year annualized over 20 years. That's quite a healthy return for investors. But what investors actually got back in investing in this market is a little bit over 4%. So what's the gap? What's the difference? As investors, we just try to answer a more complex question than the one presented to us. We get a little bit excited when markets go up and think that's a great time to invest. And we get despondent and dejected and demoralized when markets go down and want to pull our money out. And it's our behavior as investors that leads to the gap between what the market wants to give us, the market return, and what we actually get back in experience. Now there's um, a psychologist, an Austrian psychologist, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he says between a stimulus and a response, there's a space. And in that space, we can react, or we can choose to respond. So as investors, when we see markets falling, so often we react. We want to stop investing in equities and company stocks and move the cash. We want to stop paying our premiums, or we want to pull our money out of the market altogether. But what we're going to talk about today is how the successful investor stops and responds. But that zen-like detachment, that's incredibly difficult to achieve. And there's some key reasons for that. Let's start by taking a look at our brains. So it's quite a big brain, so possibly it belongs to one of your, your teachers rather than someone who works for an insurance company. Now there's three key areas of the brain I'd like to highlight. Firstly, the stem. This is the oldest area of the brain. It's also called the reptilian part of the brain. Because that very, very basic fight versus flight decision-making process is housed here. Basically, reptiles' brains haven't evolved past this point. So, if you imagine you're, you're a crocodile and you see a larger crocodile coming towards you, what's your instinct? Well, you don't want to fight him because he's bigger than you, so you run for it. That's the same sensation we feel as investors. A market fall, a market crash feels immeasurably bigger than us, so what do we want to do? We want to take our money out of the market and run for the hills. The second area of the brain is the limbic system, uh, either side of the thalamus. This is where your emotions are housed. Fear and greed being the two key emotions we feel as investors. Mm, fear and greed, not a great place to be making investment decisions. And it's not until we get to here, the neocortex, where the rational and reasoned thinking takes place. Now this is where we want to make our investment decisions, based on reason and ration and logic, rather than emotion and instinct. But it's an incredibly tough thing to do. But it's very, very valuable. And as an industry, we underestimate 
the importance of managing our behaviour as investors. What do we talk about? Cryptocurrencies, hedge funds, derivatives, shorting. We get wrapped up in complexity. But there's real value to keeping it simple and focusing on your behaviour to begin with. We see this in three studies, the value of Zen-like detachment that have come out. Now these studies look at the value of customers who've had a go investing themselves, taking a DIY approach, versus customers who work with a financial professional, a financial advisor. Now what we think is, you know, a financial professional, they're into all the complexity, that's the value they're adding. It's not the case. So Vanguard had a study where they looked at the value of assets working with a financial professional versus customers who've done it themselves. They found the carry, the additional value, is about 3% annualised a year. Now Vanguard stopped and broke this 3% down. They found of that 3%, a big chunk, over half, was down to the financial professional sitting with a customer and managing their behaviour, hand-holding them. Ostensibly, nothing else came close. Now this 3%, it won't appear on a valuation statement and it won't be added in a linear fashion, but it's most valuable at times of stress, when markets are going up or markets are going down. So in terms of investors and our competition over the next coming months, how can we help you? How can we help you focus on your behaviour first before looking at the tools you'll use to manage and build a portfolio. Well, I've got with four C's for you, four words beginning with C. The first of these is consistency. Mm, consistency. Sounds a little bit dull, right? We all like to believe in the indomitability of the human spirit. We wanted Rocky to beat Ivan Drago. We wanted Gary Kasparov to beat the chess computer Deep Blue. But actually, when it comes to investing, Having a structure and a process and a consistent methodology can pay real dividends. Now why is this? Well, when it comes to a stressful situation, when do we under duress, like when markets are falling, as people, as human beings, we lose 13% of our ability to make a rationed and reasoned decision. I don't know about you guys, but I've not got 13% of my smarts to go up these days. So having a structure, process and system can pay real dividends in these times of stress. But what stresses us out? Well, actually we underestimate the impact other people have on our stress levels. So when other people get excited, we tend to get excited. When other people get stressed out and worried, we tend to get stressed out and worried. Now this is a behavioural fact that's not been lost on the City of London Transport Authority. Now they looked at the London Underground and realised, in reality, it's a train in a metal tube of a half a kilometre under the ground, packed with people. So it's potentially a very, very stressful situation to be in, particularly during rush hour. We've got lots of commuters. So what do they do? Well, during rush hour, during peak times, they started to play classical music on the tube trains. Found this nice, soothing music calmed down stressed out commuters. And the amounts of complaints and assaults on their staff reduced dramatically. But it's not just the environment that has an impact on our investment decision making process. It's us as well. Our own discretion or gut feeling. There's a famous systematic investor, a gentleman called Joel Greenback. I don't know if you guys have seen the film The Big Short uh, about Mike Burry's uh, fund, Sign Capital, that invested in US property companies. Well, Joel Greenback, featured in the film, was one of the early investors in that fund. He's a systematic investor, so he uses algorithms and formulae to decide which company stocks to invest in. And from the back of his algorithm, he created an investment portfolio of about 80 or so stocks for his investment house, Gotham Capital. Now, what was interesting, he offered investors two ways to access these company stocks. Firstly, they could buy it off the shelf as a portfolio, the Gotham Capital Growth Portfolio. Or, they could use their own discretion to make their own decisions from that list of 80 stocks. They might go, mm, I once bought a car from that car company, I'm not going to invest in that company's stock. Or, my dad worked for that company for 30 years, I'm definitely 
going to invest in that. Now the Gotham Capital Growth Portfolio returned grew by about 86% over three years. So that's quite a good head start for these investors. But actually, using their own discretion, they did just underperform the portfolio. They underperformed the market as a whole. It was an absolute disaster in terms of investors trying to use their own knowledge to outperform. And now this isn't a one-off example. There have been studies in the past where very, very clever investment types have been put against simple investment models. 94% of the time, the model wins. There's a, there's a mathematician called Jim Simons. Uh, he's won many maths awards. He's literally Jedi smart when it comes to mathematics. He also runs an investment fund. Incredibly smart guy. And he says, we don't try and do anything too clever. We don't try and overcomplicate it. We let the model do the work. So consistency, the first of our C's. The second is conviction. Conviction is an inc incredibly interesting one. If we go back uh, to the start of the century, there was a big time investor, kind of the Warren Buffett of his day, called John Pierpoint Morgan, JP Morgan. Uh, if they had TVs then, he'd be the kind of guy who would be a talking head on the news, giving a view on the markets, a very, Incredible expert. Um, as an expert, he was being continually asked of what he thought of markets or particularly a uh, particular company stock. Now he had enough of this, had enough of being hassled. He was quite a grumpy guy. So he called a press conference full of journalists and naturally the first question he was asked was, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Morgan, in which direction is the US equity market going to move? He picked up the microphone, looked at the guy and said, so, um, it will fluctuate. Dropped the microphone and walked out. Spoken like a true millionaire. But he had a point. Uh, recently a professor called Dr. Philip Tetlock looked at 80,000 data points relating to expert forecasters. So a forecaster might say, I think the US equity market uh, will be up 5% over the next year. Then he looked at the reality linked to that forecast. Only one in 170 times was the forecast within 5% of the reality. So these forecasters statistically are wildly wrong. Why are we so interested in what they have to say as investors? Well, these forecasters are often quite entertaining, they're in the news, they've become prominent because they might keep making the same forecast year in, year out, and it's right in one year and their position as an investment guru, as an investment genius, although they might be wrong the following years and the next 10 years following that. As investors, why are we so interested in what they have to say? Well, the brain is, is like an efficiency maximizing unit. Um, it, when it's working hard, it uses about 20% of the calories your body is using. So it's always looking for ways to do things more efficiently, to so, sort of slipstream like a cyclist might follow another cyclist. And as we live in an information age where the amount of information off the internet, YouTube, triples every two days, what we find easier is to pick a seemingly credible economist or investment forecaster and instead of thinking really hard about investment stuff, doing our own research, doing the work and come up with the model, we just think, he seems credible, let's do what that guy says. Let's do what he says because he's on the news, he's a talking head. But the real value as an investor comes from having your own model, formulating your own views and sticking to it. That, however, my friends, takes courage. And that leads us on to the third C. Courage. Let's take it back to the summer of 2018. It's the FIFA Football World Cup. It's the first knockout stages. It's England against Colombia. One all left after extra time and it's gone to penalties. You guys are the English goalkeeper. I'm the Colombian striker. I'm lining up for my penalty. 60 million people watching on TV. What do you do? Well, statistically, football penalty kicks are distributed quite equally. About a third to the left of the goal, a third to the middle, and a third to the right of the goal. But football goalkeepers move either to the left or the right 
about 94% of the time. Now, why do they do this? Well, put yourselves in the goalkeeper's shoes. The penalty keeper's, the, the striker's lining up the kick. What he doesn't want is to be the chap who just stands there and the ball gets booted into the goal and 60 million people watch it on TV. He feels like he should do something. He feels like he should make an effort. It's an action bias. Now, as investors, we have the same bias. We see markets moving either up or down, and we feel like we should be doing something, particularly when markets are moving down. Now, Dr. William Sharp, father of the Sharp Ratio, which is uh, one of the metrics we use um, as an investor, found that to try and move in and out of the markets and get the same return as somebody who's bought and held a market, you have to get your market timing right 84% of the time, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. A gentleman called Warren Buffett, I don't know if you guys might have heard of him, a very well recognized investor, he does try and time the market move in and out of company shares. And if he gets his market timing right 50% of the time, he's very, very happy with that. What William Sharp also found is that 80% of the returns from an equity market come from 2% of the time. So in trying to move out of a market and avoid the falling days, the bad days, you're quite likely to miss the good days as well. So doing less than feels right, doing less than you think. Now be very, very deliberate with that. It's not doing nothing or just sitting on your hands, it's doing less than feels right as an investor. But hang on, that's counterintuitive, right? Think about your day-to-day -day life. So if you want to get better grades at school, what do you do? You study harder. If you want to get into the football team, what do you do? You work harder on your football skills. If you want to know more stuff, you read more books. But as an investor, to get a better return, you do less. That doesn't sit comfortably with the other areas of our day-to-day -day lives. But Fidelity looked at this. Fidelity, you're a big asset manager in the US. They pulled out a list of customers who'd seen the best positive returns over a time period. And they thought, is there a golden thread hanging these investors together? So what did they do? They called them up. And what was the response from most of these investors? Uh, uh, Fidelity Investment? Oh, I'd forgotten about that. They hadn't done anything with it. They hadn't touched it. They just invested and let the market do the heavy lifting. The most successful investors were the investors who'd forgotten they were investors at all. So courage, the courage to do less than you think. That leads us to the final C, which is clarity. Clarity is thinking out why you're investing in the first place. So for you guys, in investors, it's about trying to win that competition. It might, that might be your primary goal. It might be about trying to beat your friends. It might be, about trying to have a really stable portfolio that runs the course and generates returns consistently over the period of the competition. If we look at the glass global financial crisis, the S&P 500, so the valuation of the 500 largest companies in the US, had fallen about 40%. So investors were taking their money out of that market in the billions of US dollars. But there was two type of investor that still kept paying their money in. It was investors saving towards US retirement accounts and US college accounts. So why did they keep paying premiums in when everyone pulled their money out? It's because they weren't benchmarking themselves against this arbitrary financial index, the S&P 500. It was about, if I keep paying my premiums, I'm going to achieve that goal of retirement or putting my kid through college. A very simple but deeply held goal. We can realign our investment behavior with our goal, with how we're investing, that becomes incredibly positive and incredibly powerful. If we look at the example from the Philippines, there's a group of customers on a very, very low income who have seemingly no ability to put money away each month. And the bank they were with tried all sorts of behavioral sticks and behavioral carrots but seemingly nothing was working until they set them all up with an online bank account. They log onto the account and what's the first thing they see is a picture of their family, their husband, their kids, the things that are most important to them. And there's an immediate connection between 
their behavior on their online account to how much they spend and the things that matter most to them. The end result was a 200% increase in their propensity to save. So that's the four C's that are key to managing behavior as an investor. Why I focus so much on behavior in this first session is that it's a key driver of the long-term investment returns that we experience as investors. So investing is easy, right? Or is it? Well, now it's your turn to find out. It's your turn to find out with the investors competition. What we're going to give you guys is 100,000 virtual US dollars. You've got the opportunity to build your own portfolio and invest in some of the, the kind of funds we make available within our products. So next week, we're going to be talking about asset classes, funds, diversification and portfolio construction. But until then, thank you for your time, guys. Thank you for watching, and I hope to speak to you and, and see you all soon.